scale of times and says, I'll follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus says, no one puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus has set his face towards Jerusalem. He's past the point of no return. Luke sets these two stories at the beginning of this journey that don't seem to relate to each other. The story of the way the disciples respond to the Samaritans' rejection and the story of those who want to follow Jesus but aren't ready to fully commit. And as we look carefully at these two stories, we have to ask why Luke hooked them together in this way. What does it mean to us? It's a long journey through these 10 chapters of Luke's gospel, but no matter how long it takes, how much time it takes, we have to keep in mind where the final destination will be. We will end up in Jerusalem, where Jesus is betrayed, he's tried, he's tortured, he's executed, and where he will rise again from death, and where his disciples will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit after he has ascended into heaven. Jerusalem will be the center of the activity for the early church. It's the geographic location that connects the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah with the New Testament's realities of Christ's coming and the new life that Jesus introduces into the world. The new life is a complete apple cart upset of everything that has gone before. Richard Schaefer writes, adopting a life of discipleship cannot be part-time or a momentary commitment. It is a life-changing shift of indirection and priorities. The Gospels are filled with examples of people who've made the shift. We read story after story of people who have surrendered everything to follow Jesus. And you'd think that after living with Jesus for three years, his closest friends would be perfect examples of the impact such a life-changing shift can have. But you'd be wrong. James and John have just argued over who will be the greatest in Christ's kingdom. These brothers have been jockeying for positions of power next to Jesus. And so when they come into the Samaritan village as an advanced team, getting things ready for Jesus to come to do his preaching and healing thing, they already have a chip on their shoulders. They apparently didn't quite hear Jesus telling them that they needed to be like, to become like little children. Or maybe in their smug self-righteousness, they just assumed that Jesus was talking to the other disciples. It's not me, Lord, right? I mean, it's them. They're the ones that don't understand, even though we're the ones who said who gets to sit on the right or the left. So when the, when the Samaritans turn James and John away because they aren't happy that their village is just a pit stop on the way to Jerusalem, the disciples are offended. But get why. They're offended because the Samaritans are offended. Turn back in the gospel on the in the bulletin and read what what that passage says that when they get there and what they're looking for that they weren't happy. Do you see how this escalates? We see it on social media all the time, don't we? People get offended by the way other people get offended. 
Think about that for a minute, right? I mean, nothing's been going on this week, right? I mean, if you're on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, maybe even TikTok, I have no idea. I was in Savannah. I mean, there were literally things written on chalk on the sidewalks. People get offended by the way other people get offended. And before you know it, people are calling down fire from heaven on each other, convinced that only they know the right path the right understanding, the right truth. David Loss writes, even disciples can see those who thwart their plans or disagree with their convictions as the enemy. Even disciples can decide that to be different is to be less than human. Maybe this isn't such a great example of discipleship after all. But Luke gives us another possibility. The second section of this passage shows the parade of would-be Jesus followers who each have some obstacle preventing them from going all in. And some of these obstacles sound like genuine issues worthy of some grace from Jesus. It's a little shocking to hear him raise the bar instead of lowering it. I don't know about you. I mean, I've lived with this text a little more as I prepared for today. Maybe even as you listened to it this morning or, you know, you read it in the bulletin. I mean, it made me kind of step back and think I wasn't worthy. Because I've got obstacles. One person's ready to follow Jesus until it's clear there won't be any stops at any fine hotels or restaurants. It's be a little more like camping without a tent, and I don't know that anybody was weaving any old grocery bags to make a mat for them. Following Jesus isn't going to be glamorous. Another's ready to follow Jesus just as soon as his father dies and he can settle the estate. We don't know whether his father's already near death or at the peak of health at the moment. Let the dead bury their own dead, Jesus says. You go to proclaim the kingdom of God. And notice again in this text that Jesus first invites him invites this would-be disciple to follow him, but in the end, he ends up saying, go, not come. And then we get the one who sounds a lot like Elijah, wanting to say goodbye to his family before setting out to follow Jesus. And the way Jesus answer him, answers him reminds us of that story we heard earlier, where Elijah was busy plowing with his team of oxen when Elijah called him into service. By the way, good job on all those words, because you had a lot in that lesson. I mean, Pentecost is a hard one, but this one's not easy either. And so Elijah called him into service, and Jesus says, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Ouch. I don't know about you, but sometimes I look back. So is the lesson here all about becoming homeless in order to preach the kingdom while wearing blinders that prevent us from looking anywhere but straight ahead? I don't think so. In fact, this may not be a lesson in discipleship at all. The whole passage may not be so much about us and how we follow as much as it is about Jesus and how Jesus leads. This passage is not primarily about discipleship, and it isn't even about Jesus' heroic courage as he sets his face towards Jerusalem and ultimately the cross. 
Rather, it is a single-mindedness of purpose that is prompted by God's profound love for humanity and for all the world. Jesus has set his face towards Jerusalem. Nothing is going to stop him from getting there. Not a village full of grudging Samaritans or a couple of power-hungry fishermen. Not a long line of would-be disciples who aren't ready to go all in quite yet. Not you. Not me. Jesus is determined to do what he came to do. He knows his mission, and nothing will stop him from fulfilling it. And why is he so focused, so intent on getting to Jerusalem? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. Not just a sign you hold up at the end of an end zone during a football game, John 3.16. Because Jesus can see that even his closest friends, who should know by now how to live in a radically different way, are still stuck in the world's way of calling down fire on people who reject them. Because Jesus understands the desire of those would-be followers, and he knows their desire can never be matched by commitment without his help. Because Jesus sees you and me as we struggle. We struggle to love people we think are wrong without judging them. He sees how we fail at this time again and again. And he knows that unless he gets to Jerusalem to complete his mission, we will be stuck forever in a world where lines are drawn, where arguments over who is in and who is out can tear churches apart, where people who should be sowing the world, showing the world what it means to love each other as Christ loved you, can only show the world how wrapped up we are in our own needs and our own desires. Unless he gets to Jerusalem, Jesus knows we will never know just how deeply God loves us. That's why his face is set. There is no turning back. That's the gift that Christ gives to us. That sure and certain hope of the gift of the resurrection. It is our gift, and because of that amazing gift of grace and love in our lives, we are invited on this discipleship journey. Our gospel lesson today tells us that that journey won't be easy. There are sacrifices that will be made and hard choices, but when we set our eyes on the gift found in Jerusalem, when we see that love shown, that grace offered, how could we not want to? But let me be clear. This gift is not dependent on us and our actions. James and John struggled to understand that. And so will we. Those that approached Jesus on the road came with a desire, but also excuses. And so will we. The road to Jerusalem, the road of discipleship has struggles and difficulties, but Jesus goes ahead and invites us to keep our eyes on the gift of the cross and living out our identity as children of God, a child of the resurrection. And that changes 
everything. For that love changes us. And when we live that love into the world, it changes the world. So that love, so that in that love, we can answer God's call in our lives. And today, in this place, Christ will come in bread and wine to nourish us, to feed us for the journey so that we will never forget the gift that God has given to us, making us God's own. And in that love, we can answer God's call in our lives. And as we sang, here I am, Lord, is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. Christ will lead us. We don't have to look back because we have a promise of a future that God claims us and names us in. And so we can trust and hope and know that wherever God leads you, wherever God leads me, wherever God leads St. John's Lutheran Church, the Southeastern Synod, the ELCA, the United States, the world, God will be with us. And for that, we say amen. Amen.
Thank you. 
of abundance you have set before us on all the harvest. And we, under the goodness, strengthen us to every good field, and give us fair fruit to good of all. In the name of Jesus, amen. The Lord be with you. And all of you. Lift up your hearts. And be given in the Lord. It is indeed right in our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Thank you. 
Send us forth to live with others, both friend and stranger, that all they come to know your love. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Does anyone have any announcements? Okay. I don't have service. <laughs> the next Sunday service will be online. 
they'll come from the synod, the synod from the bishop's office. So you'll get them to be in the for the ladies. Sure. Yeah. Uh, secondly, the sign out here, it's still down. <laughs> I looked for a resurrection, it didn't happen. So I asked last week by the 30th if you have any kind any ideas. Any, anything you see, any kind of a church sign, send it to Lynn or myself, and we'll make copies. And then next time we'll come in service, which would be whatever it is, I can't remember. It, two weeks, thank you. Two weeks, and we will have the pictures, and we'll go by, and everybody make a, a, a vote on what they like to have. We get it going. We have the money to get it fixed, not that much, but enough to get it fixed, so enough for a nice new one. Um, nothing like Las Vegas or anything like that. It's circus, circus. So something that's really going to be in good taste, but if we can see, not too busy, where people don't want to look at it, they drive by, it's too flashy. So something simple but elegant. So we get that next week, then that'd be great. And so after this, everybody go and eat and uh, let the pastor bless the food and let her have a plate first, if you don't mind. And then we'll ask her questions that maybe she can answer. That's really all I have. Thank you. I'm sorry. Any other announcements? I'm sorry, my bad. Any other announcements? Sorry, Amy, you didn't do that. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. I think Laura, if Laura runs, maybe get ready to do the thing. Yeah. And then we get to the chill. Quite welcome. When we get to the other room, let's say a prayer together over the two of you to bless you on that journey. God, the author of life, Christ, the living cornerstone and the life-giving spirit of adoption, bless you now and forever. Our um, setting him is, I know it says in the bulletin it's 767, it's really 768. They're both the same title, but you'll know this version better. <laughs>